Well, hello. I just want to thank you so much for joining us here at, at uh, Faith Church Swansea as we journey through this epistle to the Philippians. And I just want to tell you, I'm so excited about this theme uh, because think about it like this. The whole theme of Philippians is that we can rise above life's tests and have joy. Now, we covered the uh, foundation or the, uh, uh, the beginnings of this Philippian church, and we talked about how Paul and Silas were in prison for casting a demon of divination out of a young girl. And then the, the leaders of the town tortured them and, and, and put them into the dungeons for their lost revenue. So while chained and having been tortured in the darkness, they lift their hearts and their voices to God, and they praised and worshiped him. And while they were doing that, the other prisoners heard it. People without God listen intently when we worship in spite of our circumstances. More importantly, God was listening. Christian worship that rises above circumstances is a very powerful thing. And we learned that as we looked at the origins of this beautiful missional church in Philippi. Now, years later, Paul wrote an epistle to this same church. And that word epistle is something we kind of throw around a lot. It's a nice little Sunday school word. But what does it really mean? Surprisingly enough, it has a very simple meaning. So simple, in fact, it makes me wonder why we don't just use the English word for it, but all an epistle is is a letter. So Paul wrote a letter to this church in Philippi many years later, about 10 or 11 years later, and it was hand-delivered to them so that they could read it and hear the apostles' heart for them as a church. Now, whether you know it or not, 21 of the 27 New Testament books are actually epistles. And 13 of those 21 letters, epistles, were written by the Apostle Paul, and four of those 13 epistles written by Paul were written while he was in prison. In fact, this letter to the Philippians was written while he was in Rome and was incarcerated. Now again, this is a study of Christian joy. Wouldn't you love to have a joyous and happy life? I know I would, and I know that at times I haven't. And that's the message that Paul would have us to get from this. Paul uses the word joy or its derivatives 19 times in only four chapters. So here's the point of this letter again. You can rise above life's tests and have joy. Now, how could he say that? He must not know how hard it is to live in the 21st century. He must not know how hard our life is when he wrote this. Because again, he wrote this 2,000 years ago. Surely his life was easier than ours. Let's just compare. Again, he wrote this letter in prison. Uh, he was awaiting trial and chained constantly to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. At trial, he would either be acquitted and freed, or he would be beheaded by Caesar. Is your life today any more difficult than that? How could a man facing those conditions, facing those tests, speak so surely about joy? How could he rise above those tests and be happy? The answer is given in another concept that he voiced 16 times in this very same letter, the mind. Listen to what he says in Philippians 2, chapter 1 and 2. If you have a Bible, this would be a good time to turn there for yourselves. Philippians 2, 1 and 2 says this, If there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy, Paul says, by thinking the same way. Have the same mind, so to speak. Also, have the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. So what's the secret to this life of joy, regardless of our, our tests? How we view them, our minds. We as Christians can rise above our tests as soon as we learn how to look at them and how to think about them. The secret to Christian joy is truly found in the way we think, our perception. Our attitude must rise above our tests. Namely, attitude determines altitude. But we must first see and expect that there are going to be tests in this life that can bring down our joy, bring down our attitude, ground us, take our happiness, or better said, there are going to be tests in this life that can bring down our attitude and ground our joy. Paul names these tests in four categories, one for each of the four chapters of the book. Chapter 1, we talk about circumstances. How many of the circumstances in your life can you really control? What about the weather, traffic, time? You get the picture. The things in life that tend to, the circumstances that tend to aggravate us the most. The reality of it is 
we all know we can't live for Christ and avoid circumstances. So we must learn how to deal with them. Ch chapter 1 will help us with that. We'll talk more about that in a moment. More about that in a moment. And chapter, two we'll and chapter 2 we'll talk about the joy grounder that people can be. I just must be honest with you. That's the toughest one for me. I don't know what it is, but if there's something that tends to bring my joy down, it's, it's, it's people at times. Uh, there's an expression we use, a kill joy. And that's a person who spoils other people's pleasure or joy. So a Debbie Downer, or if you're familiar with the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh series, uh, an Eeyore in life. Now, all of us have certainly been grounded by something somebody did and lost our joy. But before we focus too intently on that, we must also remember that there's times when we've been the cause of the same thing for others. We've been the cause of another person's joy being grounded. So, again, we can't live for Christ and avoid people. In fact, it's the opposite. Chapter 2 is going to help us to learn how to deal with the people in our lives and have joy. Well, if a killjoy... Let's talk about the things in this life. Chapter 3 is going to do that with us. If a killjoy is a person that can bring down your joy, when we talk about a killjoy circuit, we're talking about a device that creates interference with electronic equipment. There are things in our life that will create interference between us and the Spirit of God and that will ground our joy. We need to learn how to deal with those things. What things in this life that you have or don't have that can kill your attitude and ground your joy are you going to take with you when you leave? Once we get our mind around that, perhaps it's easier to look at a more eternal, infinite view of things because we can't live for Christ and avoid things either. So what about worry? That's the big one, uh, especially if you're a parent or if you're a business owner. It really doesn't matter. If you're American, you probably have tons of worry. And so let's talk about worry for a second because that's what chapter four is going to deal with. We often worry about circumstances we can't control. We often worry about people that we can't control. And lastly, get the theme, we often worry about things that we can't control. Chapter 4 is going to wrap it all up, and we're going to talk about worry, which is the biggest joy grounder of all. So, how do we release these bonds, these attitude grounders, and rise above them with attitudes of joy? We must cultivate the right kind of mind. Again, outlook determines outcome. In the following weeks, as we explore Philippians, we will address the kind of mind that rises above life's tests, no matter how bad they may be, with joy. The joyous, the joyous Christian mind, chapter 1, is the single mind. This chapter deals directly again with the, the assaults of the joy grounder of circumstances. Paul teaches us a lesson from his own life. He says, look, I live to enjoy Christ not circumstances. And he also would teach us that he didn't look at Christ through his circumstances. He looked at his circumstances through Christ. The lens that he have on life changed everything. So for ourselves, let's live to enjoy Christ instead of living to enjoy our circumstances. And also let's look at our circumstances through Christ as opposed to what we often do looking at Christ through our circumstances. Chapter one is going to be great because it's going to talk about that. That will lead us to the submissive mind of chapter 2. Again, that chapter focuses on capturing and controlling the joy grounder that people can be. Why do people often aggravate us so much? I think people aggravate us because deep down we really all want to get our own way. Now imagine the result if I put myself first, you put yourself first, he puts himself first, she puts herself first, all right, dot, dot, dot. What are we talking about then? We're talking about full-scale war. It sounds like middle school, kind of. But that's what we do. We all want to be the center of our own universe. We must learn to single-mindedly put Christ first. Once we've done that, we must single-mindedly put others second. And yes, if you're keeping score, that means that we single-mindedly put ourselves third behind them. It's not that we don't care for ourselves. It's just that we have a a mind that's submitted enough to put Christ and others first. Once we've done that, then we can develop that spiritual mind that we need in chapter 3. In this chapter, we're going to discover that Paul used the word things 11 times. Paul certainly saw things as a joy grounder that must be addressed. So here's what the spiritually minded Christian does. They look at the things of this world from a spiritually minded perspective. 
or they see them from heaven's point of view, which good news, if you believe Paul and you believe Philippians, which I do, we're already citizens there anyway. So we view it from our home in heaven where we're citizens. We're actually in our home away from home now. Jim Elliott, the martyred missionary to South America, wrote this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. We start out wanting to possess things only to find that things end up possessing us. Listen, it's okay to possess things. Nothing wrong with that. But don't let those things possess you. When we get to chapter 4, we're going to talk about the secure mind. Again, remember, chapter 4 is about worry. I've become convinced that worry is actually wrong thinking, the mind, and wrong feelings, the heart, about circumstances, people, and things. So if we have the single mind, which cultivates the submissive mind, which then cultivates the spiritual mind, we won't have much problem with worry. We'll be secure in our minds. Cultivating the single mind, the submissive mind, and the spiritual mind will help us rise above the problem of worry. So as if you know me, I am prone to say, so what now what? How do we put all this to practice in our lives? Because if it doesn't turn into action, it's not really any good in the end. Number one, let's be sure you're a Christian. Each chapter of this letter begins with either in Christ or in the Lord. You cannot have the single mind, the submissive mind, the spiritual mind, or most certainly the secure mind if you do not have a healthy personal relationship with Jesus. Number two, admit your failures. If you've not been living the joyous life that comes from having the right attitude, then reality You've been living, I've been living, we've been living in sin, in sin instead of in Christ. Confess that to God and give it to Him. Number three, surrender your mind daily to Christ. When you find yourself losing your joy, ask yourself, okay, is my mind right? If not, confess it, let it go, and ask God to restore you to your right mind, so to speak. I'm always asking to be restored to my right mind. And then lastly, number four, Look for opportunities to put your mind to work. God is going to test us daily as we study these principles together. Remember, the untested life is worthless. Until your faith is tested, you don't really know if you even have any. And let me say it again. So what now what? Learning and living go together. God will give us the grace we need as we practice the right kind of attitude. Joy will well up in our hearts Joy that rises above circumstances, above people, and above things, and joy that conquers worry and fills us with the peace of God. And on that note, God's peace to you. God bless. We look forward to sharing these Sunday mornings together here at Faith Church Swansea. Goodbye.